And what Paul is trying to establish in 118 and 320 is not just that all sin, that's easy. I mean, duh, who doesn't know that? Occasionally I do hear even Christian scholars saying things like, well, that's it. It's kind of hard to convince people that they're sinners. Oh, really? Is that really so hard? I mean, think about you and think about, even if you don't believe in a God, just conceptualize for the moment the possibility of a God who is not human and who is perfect. It's really hard for you to think that, you know, you're, you're a sinner in relation to that being. I mean, that's going to be pretty easy, I would think. And if it isn't, then just ask your spouse and they'll help you out. They'll tell you, no, you're really not God or anything close to it. Um, it's, that shouldn't be hard to fathom, but that's an easy one. The issue is, Paul goes beyond that to say not only that all our sinners are under sin, under the power of sin, but that all deliberately suppress the truth about God accessible to them. So they, it's not that they don't know and sin, it's that they know and sin in spite of that knowledge. That's the argument that Paul is making in 118 to 320. In the case of Gentiles, the argument is made on the, in other words, they suppress the truth about God. Which, and here we have a, 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 a natural law kind of argument here, a nature argument. Some Presbyterians say, well, that's unpresbyterian. Well, first of all, A, it's not. If you look through the Book of Confessions, you'll see several texts which make a nature argument. And B, if you look at Calvin's commentary in Romans, he accepts Paul's nature argument. And C, Paul himself had as a nature argument. So by definition of all those things, it's reformed. Okay, it's just that it's limited. Sure, you have to have direct divine revelation from that in the gospel. But you do know enough from the natural world around you to be condemned. And that nature argument is a scriptural nature argument. And in the case of idolatry, he says you know enough because the knowable aspect of God is transparent to them. God made it transparent to them. Uh, because the invisible, his invisible attributes from the creation of the world are clearly seen, mentally apprehended by means of the things made, both his eternal power and divinity, so that they are without excuse. On apogaletos. Without excuse, no apology can be offered. Okay, so if you think God can be reduced to a statue, Paul says, in the image of humans or even worse, animals, if you're from Egypt, then you have suppressed the truth about who God is simply by gazing at the wonder of the cosmos. God has to be greater, the creator of the cosmos has to be greater still. And that's not something that can be um, narrowed down to a statue made in the image of a created thing, which you can then manipulate. God is beyond that. So you're culpable for idolatry if you commit it. And by the way, you can commit idolatry in more than one way. It doesn't have to be through the construction of a statue in the image of a deity. There are other ways of having false gods, as you're well aware. And it's in that context that he makes the point that he moves from the issue of idolatry to sex. Romans 1.18 to 32 is an extended vice list. And like Paul's vice list generally, you work with idolatry and sexual immorality, or sexual immorality and idolatry, one, two, in either order. And that's exactly what he does here. So it's not at all surprising that after dealing with the issue of idolatry in 1.18 to 23, or 1.19 to 23, he then moves on to the issue of sex. Therefore, God gave them over in the desires of their hearts to an uncleanness, a karthasia, which is a term that elsewhere in Paul is used consistently with regard to sexual offenses, coordinated with porneia and asogeia, sexual immorality and sexual licentiousness. He uses it, for example, a karthasia with regard to the issue of adultery in 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning part of the chapter. It's re reference to sexual impurity, sexual uncleanness. God gave them over to that. Now, here's the thing. We often think of the wrath of God as when a lightning bolt strikes us if we do something wrong. And if the lightning bolt doesn't strike us, we wipe our brow and say, whew, that's a relief. I'm glad I didn't get struck for that. Must not be a significant issue to God. Actually, according to Romans 1, the first stage of God's wrath occurs when God doesn't do anything about it. Because when God disciplines you, it's an indication of God's care and concern for you. We have this element appearing in the Wisdom of Solomon. We have it also appearing in Paul's argument about the abuse of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11. Discipline is a good thing, designed to move us away from actions which could lead to our destruction. So when God steps back and hands you over into the power of the sin, 
the innate impulse of sin operating in your human members and does nothing to restrain it or to move you from it, that's the first stage of God's judgment. The threat there is that if nothing should happen, sin will take control of your life and the end result of that is cataclysmic destruction on the day of the Lord. You don't want that to happen. So God, this is a passive aggressive mode, I guess, on God's part. Spec steps back and allows the power of sin to control you. And it doesn't matter that you might call that power innate. Oh, I was born that way. Well, yeah, so what? This is how Paul describes sin. Sin is an innate impulse passed on by an ancestor, running through the members of the human body, and never entirely within human control. That is sin. Look at Romans 7, 7 and 23. So the fact that you're born that way is not a really particularly powerful argument for a Christian because we believe in a fall and we believe according to Romans 5 of the introduction of sin into human flesh which means that most of the urges that we have are to do things that God expressly forbids. That doesn't make it natural in the best sense. That's desiring against the way we've been made or structured as humanity. There's a deeper sense of nature in terms of the way that God made us. And there's another sense of nature in which we've fallen into through impulses that are skewed as a result of sin to want to do what God has expressly forbidden us to do. That is not according to nature in the best sense. You may not be able to eliminate the impulse, but you're not required to carry out the impulse. You're not simply a biological robot. So to say I'm born that way or I have an innate urge I didn't ask for and I have no choice in the urge, yeah, that's how jealousy works. That's how greed works. That's how arrogance and pride work. None of these things we ask to have, they're innate urges to do what God doesn't want us to be doing. We're to be put them to death. We're to unclothe ourselves of that and clothe ourselves with Jesus Christ. Okay, so dump the whole born that way innate impulse argument, it's ridiculous. No Christian should ever hold it. If you hold it, your first problem is that you believe that kind of an argument, not whatever it leads to. God's handing us over to innate urges. This doesn't tell, talk about how innate urges start. That's not dealt with until Romans 5. This is presuming that the, you have innate urges already to do what God forbids, and God just simply steps back and allows you to be controlled by them, because that's what you want. So God's going to give you what you want. And that should alarm you when God gives you what you want, when it's wanting to do what God has forbidden you to do. Step one in judgment. Consisting of their bodies being dishonored among them. What we do sexually matters. You can efface or enhance the image of God stamped on you by what you do sexually. Animals are not made in the image of God, and God doesn't hold them responsible for what they do sexually. However, when Genesis 1 talks about us being made male and female in the image of God, it's not to say that these things are separate, but it's to say that things, these things are integrated. That is, it's to say that what you do sexually will affect that stamp of God's image on your being and could threaten to efface it rather than enhance it. So that when you do do things that are against God's will, you dishonor the person God made you to be, this is the imagery that Paul is using, dishonoring or degrading the self that God has created you to be. And you put yourself at risk vis-a-vis -vis God. He, after a nice little doxology about the Creator, he says because of this, he simply recaps, verse 26, with now a specific illustration of sexual impurity. Because of this, God gave them over to passions of dishonor. Even their females exchanged the natural use for that which is contrary to nature. This is, of course, a reference to lesbianism. You can see in the handout, I've given you a handout on Romans 124 to 127. You can see the arguments about that. Likewise, also the males, having left behind the natural use of the female, were inflamed with their yearning for one another, males with males, committing indecency and receiving back in themselves the necessary payback for their straying. Uh, why does Paul cite this example among sexual offenses? It's not odd that he follows up idolatry with sex, What's interesting is why he picks here the issue of homosexual practice. And you can see why with the nature argument. It parallels the argument about the nature argument, creation argument that's given in 118 uh, to 123 uh, about idolatry. Is that 
what the knowable aspect about God is accessible in the material structures of creation. Here now, on a horizontal level, on a sexual level, people can't say they didn't know, for example, that sexual immorality is wrong, and let's give a classic example, homosexual practice. How, would they not, how could they not be without excuse over if they engage in sex with members of the same sex? Because it ought to be obvious on the basis of the way God has constructed male and female in nature, that man and women are sexual counterparts to each other, that they each uh, form one half of the sexual spectrum, and that man sexually is completed by woman and woman by man. This is true anatomically, it's true physiologically, and it's true psychologically. At every conceivable level, the appropriate complement or a counterpart to a man is a woman and a woman and a man. And you have to deliberately work to suppress that knowledge in order to deny it. So that even Gentiles who don't have Genesis or Leviticus in front of them would be held culpable for engaging in the behavior. Because if there's enough knowledge in the material structures of the way you're made as sexual beings to know that your complement or counterpart is not a person of the same sex. When you engage in sex male to female, uh, it's two, two halves of the sexual spectrum meet and unite to form a single sexual whole. It's okay for me to say as a male, I'm only half the sexual spectrum. I have no problem with making that statement because I'm not a woman. I'm not a female. I don't get that part of the element of the spectrum. Yes, I try to be more in touch with my sensitive self and so forth, but at the end of the day, still, I'm not essentially a woman. And a woman is, in, in essence, a man. Okay? There's some basic differences between male and female at a host of levels. Okay? But when you engage in sex with members of the same sex, think about what kind of statement you're making. If, if uniting sexually involves a union between two persons into one, what's half of one? One half. Okay? You put a male and a male together, you're saying you're one half what? Not one half of the whole sexual spectrum because a woman's not in the union. You're one half male. Two males brought together, you each half male form one full male. Okay? You're saying, in effect, if you have to unite sexually with somebody who's of the same sex, you're only half your own sex. You need to be completed structurally by merger or union with somebody of the same sex. Two females you attempt to unite, you're saying, in effect, you're half female. Two half females make a whole female. Okay? That's the argument you're essentially making. And that is sexual narcissism and sexual self-deception in the view of scripture, because you're not half your own sex. You're half of the whole sexual spectrum, but you have uh, a wholeness with regard to your specific sex that you are, which you can't complement structurally by union with another. When you do, it dishonors the sexual self by treating the sexual self as only half in intact with respect to your own sex. That's the key problem with homosexual practice. The issue of inability to procreate is not the main reason why it's wrong, it's simply a symptom of the root harm. You can see in the handout that I gave you a whole series of texts that indicate that they knew in the ancient world both about committed homosexual relationships and they knew about homosexual orientation as an innate impulse uh, that people don't always have a choice over having and that people can be exclusively oriented around. This already exists, these concepts in the ancient world to argue that these are new knowledge pieces of information that radically change our understanding of scripture simply indicates when people say that they don't know the ancient evidence from the Greco-Roman milieu. 